Hey everyone, welcome again to the final session of our 2023 PD extravaganza. My name is Grant Kastner. I am Extempore's community manager. Um, and today we are learning about using Extempore for efficient yet comprehensive assessments. Let's see what we're going to learn about today. There we go. Intro and session objectives. I recognize every single one of you by now. I don't think I need to give too much of an introduction onto our 2023 PDA extravaganza at this point. Uh, but for those of you watching the recording, it's you know we had a whole slate of sessions and workshops this week on uh, communicative language teaching, task-based language teaching, using language as culture, um, and or teaching culture as content. That's what I should have said. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other really high-quality presentations. You can find them on our YouTube channel and also in Sketch. They'll be embedded there. A little bit about myself, if you don't know, I taught Chinese for four years previously before getting to extemporary full time. And then here I work a lot in our marketing and helping people understand how to use the extemporary platform, which is what we'll be learning more about today. Um, writing emails, doing blogs, doing videos, making webinars like this, and putting together the PD Extravaganza like you attended this week. Today, we'll talk about why efficient assessments. Of course, why? Why should we have efficient ass assessments? We'll see extempore examples, examples on extempore for every lesson focus, interpretive-based, interpersonal, as well as presentational. And then finally, some tips for crafting some A-plus assessments, and we'll leave you with some resources. You can give me some feedback, and as well as some Q&A. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to put them in the chat. I have a second monitor over here, so I promise I'm not ignoring you. I have the chat open. Um, so feel free to engage, ask questions, and comment as we go. So let's get into it. Let's start. What, what do your assessments in your classroom look like right now? What do they entail? How long do they take? How much control do you have over your content and formatting? Please feel free to share out loud. You can put in the chat. You can unmute. Let's talk about it. How do your assessments look right now? Let's hear it. <laughs> Hi, Grant. Um, hi, hi, everyone. Um, my assessments in my Spanish one class um, pretty much can ran the, run the gamut of spontaneous on the spot. You know, I ask a question, do you understand it? You're going to verbally, uh, you know, answer it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, of course, all the way to um, the uh, assessments that we use on Schoology, which mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited about this class because my goal this year is to really, with fidelity, use extempore. Yeah. And yeah, because I I tried it last year, but I just maybe I just it it did they did not always work the way that I wanted it. Okay. And so that's my big um I'm hoping to learn that today. I want it make I want the assessments to be easy, not just for my students, but also for me to mm -hmm. assess. That's why I would do just on the spot, mm -hmm. uh, especially my verbal assessments. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing, Jeannie. Yeah, the hope the hope today is to give you some inspiration on you know plenty of different ideas and ways that you can use the platform, but also to like I said, in, you know, embed it into your class. And make it be, you know, make these little efficient assessments part of your your lesson strategies. So we have some we have some comments. Erin says she does an end unit end assessment over a couple of days using two of the three modes. Callie talks about using formatives. We can do whatever we want, though our district encourages some shared, but we must all give the same summative. And Odilia says 10 minutes of learning the words, then start the class. Assessment related to the lesson. Talking with chip and salsa time. I have to understand what chip and salsa time is, if, if you can, Odelia. This sounds very interesting. Uh, I will give a card with Pip and Salsa. Each one has uh, one of them. So uh, I give a topic about talking. Um, um, introduce yourself. And uh, Chip is going to start. And then Salsa is going to follow up. And awesome. So this is speaking. So they know the game. So no, that's they great. That, speaking time. Yeah. That's great. No, I'm I'm sure it's, it's become pretty... Uh, what's the word, uh, you know, conditioned in your students that when they hear chip and salsa time, they know exactly what that means. It's just, it's always funny how an outside teacher, like, what is chip and yeah. salsa, time? you know, that's great. Let's, let's get into it. Let's, let's talk, let's talk about efficient assessments. Why should we strive about, uh, for having efficient assessments? And I want to, I want to acknowledge that not every teacher has the same level of flexibility and control of what you can do with your assessments, but this is just from a general perspective. When you have that flexibility, why should we try to be efficient with our assessments? Let's think about it. One, 
I want to, I want to, this is sort of a poll, right? How well at any given moment, moment, do you know your students' levels in your classroom? I'm thinking about the students, not at the beginning of the year, but the ones you've been working with for weeks and months, and you really have a good idea of who the strong students are and who the, you know, the students who aren't as strong, right? How do you feel about that? Like, please, please share, share in the chat. Let me know. I think in my opinion, this might be a hot take. Most of us, I think, have a pretty good idea of where our students are at a given time and can probably predict their performance, right? Formative and some of the assessments, those provide the evidence. That's what assessments do. They give us evidence of learning, we, but we have a good idea, right? I know that, you know, Callie in the back, yeah, she might be a little bit behind other students. Whereas, you know, Mark up in the front, he's always killing it. He's always on top of it. He's always paying attention, right? We know. Right? We know from being a teacher where our students are at a given time. The assessments simply give us evidence of that. Only kidding. I'm sure Cali would be a great student. Uh, an obvious one, save time. Right, We want to save time with, with what we're doing in the class. We don't want to spend an entire class period assessing. I know I don't, at least. I want to spend time teaching. I want to spend time using the language. I want to minimize the amount of time that I have to assess my students. Yeah, Jason, I appreciate that comment. Community teachers see levels constantly. The communication is an ongoing informal assessment. Yeah, the assessment, yeah. So, so assessing occurs all the time. From the minute they walk up to the door, like Rich told us this morning, you ask your students, como estas? And then they respond with something completely unrelated. That's an assessment, right? You know that they're not following along. Like, okay, this kid doesn't know what como estas is. We got to go back. We're always learning, right? So with our assessments, what are we trying to learn? I mentioned, we just want some evidence, right? How well did my students grasp what we learned today, what we learned this week, or what we learned for this units? That's what we're trying to learn here. And that's with our efficient assessments, when they're efficient, when they're you know, produced correctly and in an efficient way, we can find that out without spending too much time on it. We just need some evidence. That's what we need, evidence or lack of evidence of learning. I also want you to think about the student experience and the mindset. Yeah, Mark, ¿cómo estás? Mi cumpleaños es el 24 de abril. Yeah, not gonna, not gonna work, kid. Okay, let's keep, let's keep going. So I put a little fire emoji here when I talk about the student experience and the mindset, because I think this might be a little bit of a hot take from myself, but when I teach, I wanna focus on acquisition and class content, and I want to provide my students opportunities to perform with low pressure, right? Emphasizing their performance and use of the language, not the test. And consider that. Consider how many times you might say the word, oh, we have a quiz on Friday. Oh, we have a test next Tuesday. I try to minimize that as much as possible in my class. I wouldn't use the word quiz. I wouldn't use the word test because then students get, they get into sort of the grade mode, right? And they're always thinking, oh, I might not do well on this quiz. I might not do well on this test. I'm not going to pass. I'm going to get a bad grade. And it's just sort of a downward spiral. Right. I don't want them thinking about that. I want them thinking about how we're using the language to do something, do something communicative. The last thing that I'm going to I'm going to push you to do, the dare of the year, don't tell your students about your assessments ever. I never did. I never told my students when we were assessing because then what they would do if I told my students, "Hey, we have a quiz on Tuesday. We have a quiz on Thursday." One, I always thought, how can you, I don't know, I don't know, I never understood how a teacher could plan an assessment 5 days in advance when you don't know what the student's level is going to be at that time or what they've learned and what they still need to review. But the other thing is, then you tell your students that, well, then they start preparing, then they memorize, they put all this effort in to, to do well on the test, but that's not their actual language. That's what they've memorized. That's what they've prepared. Ask them to do that same exam assessment a week from then when they don't know, well, you're probably going to get a much different result. So I never told my students about our assessments. I put them at the end of the class for 10 or 15 minutes, and that was that. And whatever they did on that assessment, that was a legitimate, authentic uh, version of their language. That was the level, that was the assessment that I needed. And the evidence that they gave me told me where they were at that given time, not where they were because they had reviewed three hours the night before. So bit of a hot take. I challenge you, if you can, don't tell your students about your assessments. Just give them to them at the end of class. They might say, oh, it's a pop quiz. Eventually, they'll get used to it. I'm going to take a sip of water. Any questions or comments? Let's check the chat. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, tests always, I mean, what student is not going to be afraid of a test? They don't, and they so, don't, yeah. Go ahead. Grant, I have a question about sure. the approach, which I really like. Sure. However, um, like, what do you do if a student is absent? Or like, you know, do right. they have to make yeah. up that assessment because sure, it's sure, an sure, important sure. assessment? Or right. how does that, that work? I mean, 
the logistics, the logistics around it. Yeah. Obviously you would have to find time to make it up. I, I would always let my students make up assessments as well if they didn't do as well. Right. So that, because they, like you say, like we say, the students acquire language differently at different paces, right. You know, Kelly might acquire the language that we're looking for on Friday, but you know, Joey might not get it until the next Wednesday. And if he wants to do that assessment again, that's totally fine. For students who are absent, you know, there's always a bit of a logistical challenge. I just think you have to communicate with them and be, be open. And hopefully they're open to about what they can do and making it up. Is that, does that answer your question, Aaron? Awesome. Two uh, Callie says we have to offer two additional summative assessments. Any suggestions how to approach that if we have unannounced tests? Oh, man. Yeah, it's hard for the for the long summer ones that you're sort of, for lack of a better word, forced to, to give them. I don't know. I, I really want to leave that in your hands because I never had that experience. I always had a ton of flexibility. I was very privileged in that regard. I would still, if you could, I would just prepare them as much as possible for for that upcoming assessment. And then, you know, take take it from take it from there. Acquiring for the yeah, Jason, niece and nephew acquired language to produce like very different rates of college. Yeah, that's just how it is. Give your students plenty of flexibility. Okay, so we have some reasons and we have a dare. Let's talk about some efficient assessments and what we can do. Okay, what do they look like on extempore? There's a couple main main highlights I want to point out here. Uh, you'll see here, this is from the extempore platform. This is what it looks like for students when they go into an assessment, right? They have these little tiles. These are the questions that they will answer within that assessment. Now, these tiles can be anything. Once the student taps on that tile, they can get in and they can see all sorts of different things. It could be audio, it could be reading, it could be listening, it could be speaking, it could be writing, a whole bunch of different things. With these efficient assessments, I always say five tiles max, five questions, absolute maximum, and it should not take any more really than 12 minutes. I would always allot 10 or 15 minutes at the end of class to do something like this. Once your students get used to the platform and they know the expectations, it's pretty seamless and they can uh, you know, complete these questions in that amount of time. Also, there's a mixture of modes, resources, and pedagogic tasks or target tasks, depending on what you're looking to accomplish. You want to mix it up, right? We want to have different types of responses. We want to have different inputs, different sources for students to respond to. What are they not? Let's be clear on this. They're not lengthy texts with multiple questions about that text, and they're not questions hyper-focused on a grammatical structure. I, I put up the wall of text because, you know, I, I'm, I don't think students are a big fan of just seeing this giant wall of text and then a bunch of comprehension questions after them. I'm, when, I, when I thought about putting together this presentation, you think about how much can we know, right? If a student can get six questions right on one passage and, you know, would a student who has a lower level also get all six right? I mean, we don't know, but with these types of efficient assessments, we want questions where our question on extempore, right, matching the reading or the listening, is getting as much input as possible. And we're forcing the students to interpret as much of the language as we can in order for them to respond to the question. So let's see, let's see what these questions look like on extempore. The first example I want to show, we'll talk about today. So we'll have some interpretive-based lessons, some inter interpersonal focus lessons, and presentational. The content focus for today, so all of our questions will be themed around this hobbies and making plans. And the lessons we're going to go through are input, input, interpersonal focus, and presentational focus. Uh, more often than not, I would say, you know, you're not going to have the input lesson on Monday and the interpretive Tuesday and then the presentational Wednesday. That's very, very quick, right? It's going to happen maybe over a week or two, depending on your students' acquisition and how they do with that language, as well as the language you teach. But in general, this is sort of represents... Uh, Catherine Ritz's IPA format of how she put together the lesson, the unit structure. If you do your input, then you focus on your input, your interpersonal, then you go to your presentation. Our hobby, our content focus is hobbies and making plans. These assessments, entirely up to you. These can be formative or they can be summative. It's really your call. And you can modify them in various different ways on extemporary to make them sort of more of a formative uh, field or summative. You can add timers and all sorts of other limitations um, to make them a, a high stakes type of question. Okay, let's look at it. So input-based, number one is the, the input base that we're gonna look at today. Introducing vocabulary, doing CI, target structures, to stories, text, et cetera. This little slide right here, and as we'll see in the other examples, this is just gonna go through what this type of lesson looks like or what it might look like in your class. And then we'll see what the example looks like on extemporary. So at the beginning of class, you might do a story, about two friends that are discovering one another's hobbies and interests. And the target question for this day is, what do you like to do? Right? We're learning our hobbies. We want to be able to answer the question, what do you like to do? It's a common question. We're going to hear it a lot in this lesson. 
So then you have your input review. After they hear the story, you review their vocabulary. You can do some game, Quizlet, Kahoot, GimKit, whatever your fancy is for, for vocabulary games. Any way to review that vocabulary and reinforce the vocabulary for your students. Afterwards, might give your students more opportunities to interact with that input. So if you're talking about your hobbies, you might rank them from favorite to least favorite, sorting the hobbies by what you do at home versus what you do outside, all sorts of communicative activities that students can do, can do to show that they are interpreting those words, ranking them, sorting them, putting them in different spots on their desk, whatever it might be, to show that they're interpreting the language and interacting with it in order to, again, build that vocabulary. Finally, then, you might do a scaffolded output where you answer the target question in a forum, like a discussion board, a Padlet, Poll Everywhere, whatever you like to use in your class. I like Padlet a lot. And the question would simply just be, what do you like to do? Well, you might say, oh, Grant, that's so easy. That's what they learned at the beginning of the class period. Well, yeah, that's my little mini formative assessment. Okay, can we answer the question, what do you like to do? If my students can do that. We can move on. If they can't, that tells me, hey, we're not, we're not there just yet. So this would happen in a class period, and I put a little time stamps. My Zoom pictures are covering one of these. That first part might take about 10 minutes. The second one, maybe five to eight minutes. Third step, eight to 10 minutes, and then scaffolded output, five to eight minutes as well. Obviously, it's going to range depending on your classroom situation, but this is just a general um, you know, sort of time of how this would go in my own classroom. And that adds up to right around 35 or 40 minutes. And in a 50 or 55 minute class period, that leaves me with 10 or 15 minutes at the end to assess. And what we are here to learn about today is efficient assessment. So let's see what this follow-up assessment will look like. So I have four, I believe, four questions for an input-based assessment. Once this class period is almost over and we've done all those things with the target language, we've gotten our story, we've reviewed the vocabulary, we've sorted some words, we even did a small little output task. I'm gonna give my students a couple of questions. Number one might be this. When the student goes into extempore and they click on the tile and they have to listen, First thing they hear is this question, what do you like to do? And then they have to listen to one, two, three, four, five responses to answer this question. This is efficient because you have one question here. This would not take them, I don't think, more than 30 seconds or so. If these are all four or five second clips, the student pretty much has to decide, okay, which one of these is an appropriate answer? What do you like to do? I like to play baseball. What do you like to do? I'm, I'm feeling sick today. What do you like to do? My birthday is January 3rd. They interpret, they listen to the language, they know which one is going to be, or if they have acquired the language, and if they have done well in that class today and they've learned, then they can get this one correct. So that's question number one. Question number two would be a bit of a reading task. Take a second and read it over, and I'll explain why it's in Chinese here. So here we have a reading task. You know, I was talking to my friend Bob the other day and he was telling me some of his hobbies. He said he enjoyed blank, 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 and blank. He also said he had some free time this weekend to do one of the things at the park. We should go together, right? I put the Chinese in here because this is sort of what it would look like from the students view. I wanted to put it in English so that you all could understand. But the idea is that your question would be in English, which of the following hobbies is not mentioned. This is a simple vocabulary check, right? Do my, can my students, identify the hobbies that we learned in class today. So vocabulary check, your whole text would be in the target language, right? That way the, the words are not as obvious standing out to you as they are here, but they'd have to read the whole text, be able to you know, interpret it, figure out which hobbies are mentioned, which hobby is not mentioned, and then select that correct answer from here. I put them in Chinese so that you could see, oh wait, I can't answer this right away unless I'm, inter I'm, unless, unless I'm interpreting it together. Kansu, yes, Kansu is right here, Alejandro. We'd love to read. So this is question two of this format. Any questions so far? I don't want to. I don't want to go too fast. I always. I always feel like I'm talking too fast. Thumbs up are always helpful. You can do the little icons whenever you need. Grant, would you mix like how the first example you had was a listening one? Would you have like a bunch of listening ones, and then another day would be like a bunch of the reading ones, or would you just do like a whole mix of both? I so this is mixed. Right, because because it's because it's input based. So number one would be this listening. Number two would be this reading assessment. Right, so it's definitely input based. We heard a story earlier. And now they can interpret and they can listen. Then we read the story too. We can read something as well. Number three, same thing, same text except now a different question. 
in the first question on the in number two, the first reading question, they were identifying um, vocabulary, they were identifying hobbies. Now they're interpreting more of the text. And as Callie showed in one of her presentations, which of the following questions cannot be answered? There's a whole lot more that they have to interpret here, right? So can they answer the question, what does the narrator like to do? Yes, we can. What were the Bob and what were Bob and the narrator discussing? Yes, that can be answered. Who was Bob talking to recently? Yes. When can Bob, when specifically can Bob hang out? That's not mentioned in this text. The the, the student has to be able to interpret all, all of this in the target language, pretend it's all in Chinese, and then they can select that answer. And you can put four, five, six different questions here and make it even harder for them. Right. So this is efficient because it's one question, but a correct answer of this question tells us a lot about our students' interpretive abilities. Okay, I'm just checking up, catching up on the chats. Incorporating all domains. Yeah, that's the idea here, Jamie. That's the idea. All right, number four. I think this is the last one. Yeah, this is the last one for this input-based assessment. Choose a sentence on the right that does not correspond with the image. A, B, C, or D, my friends. What do you think? Just going to let Callie do all the work. A indeed, right, A, right. Again though, these sentences are in the target language. I put them in English here because for the presence, for purpose of presentations, but it's in the target language. Your students have to be able to interpret one, two, three, four sentences, and then be able to determine, oh, hey, does this match here, right? Can this work, yes or no? And then they can finally determine the correct answer. Let's take a second and recap. I'm not an expert, but I'm gonna guess knowing my students, I think this question would take around 30 seconds to a minute. I think number three might, if, if they had already read number two, this question should take them maybe two or three minutes. Number two should take them two or three minutes. And then number one should take them maybe one minute. That adds up to eight, 10 minutes maximum. That's an efficient assessment. Right, so maybe a minute here for this question, listen and respond, or listen and choose the right response. The other thing that I'll add with this type of question is if it's taking them longer than a minute, that also is evidence, right? And telling you that if they can't figure it out on the question that you've been going, doing the entire class period, that tells you a lot. Uh, here again, yeah, read the text. Once they've read it once, then they'll be fine for the second question. They can answer together. Like I said, I think this would take about eight, nine minutes max, but it tells you a lot about your students' interpretive abilities. I'll get to the end about multiple choice. I know students get luck, can get lucky on a multiple choice question, but that's why we want our questions to be specific, very detailed, and require a lot of, a lot of interpretive um, in order for them to respond correctly. And I will always encourage you to put more than four if you feel compelled. Okay, let's move to, We've recapped. Let's move to interpersonal based lessons. Any questions I can ask? I don't want to go too fast. Fast. Any questions I can answer before we move to interpersonal? Okay, let's keep going. So for an interpersonal based lesson, this is just like the first one that I showed for inputs. What might we have? We might have an input review of clothes. Clothes is just a basic fill in the blank exercise. Um, Hot take, I really like using clothes. They're very simple, they're very straightforward, and they tell me if the students know the words or not. I know they're not super communicative or super task heavy, but it requires reading, it requires interpreting. I really like them and I think they're effective. Uh, and they're great for reading for Chinese because we're always trying to learn the characters. Set the scene with more input. So maybe you have another story in this in this lesson about Tempo and Pore are the names the imaginary names of our extemporary mascot here, where you're reinforcing vocabulary, right? With another little story. Then for interpersonal, you might give an interpersonal survey. Ask your peers about their favorite hobbies so that you can figure out what to do, what, figure out who, excuse me, who to invite to the cookout and what to do at the cookout. So our main task here is figuring out what to do for a cookout this coming week. That is our task. May close, C-L-O-Z-E, is just a, it's a fill in the blank exercise. We have a text and you remove words from it, you put blanks in there and you have students fill those in. That's close. Finally, after the students do the survey, if my slides load, oh my gosh. Oh no, that's all we have. Hold on. Oh, add in the times. Yeah, so here we are. So we have our times. Again, input review with close if you're really reinforcing it and, and, and going over that, 10 minutes maybe. Setting the scene with more input is another 10 minutes interpersonal 10 to 15 minutes around there 
adds up right to around 35, 40, 45 minutes with plenty of time left to review for an end of class assessment. Let's see then what we could do for an interpersonal assessment or an, an assessment after an interpersonal focused lesson. So here for an efficient interpersonal assessment, what I like to do once my students have done a survey or some type of interpersonal task where they're getting information, in this case, getting information from for about a cookout, what people like to do, when they're going to be free, when's the best time to host the cookout. We're taking that information that we got in class and looking at our paper or wherever we recorded that, and then using that to respond on extempore. It's the follow-up. We do an interpersonal task in order to get information. What are we doing with that information afterwards? It doesn't just stop at the end of the survey. So here are the question asked students. Using what you learned, share as much as you can about your student, about your classmates' hobbies. Then make a decision. That's the task here. What two activities should you host at the cookout and why? In this assessment, there's a one minute to review timer. So they review the question. They can see they have a minute to prepare their response. So they're thinking, they're thinking, they're thinking. And once that ends, they can then start responding and they have a minute to respond to the question. Obviously, once they get in, they would not spend more than two minutes on this question. But it's good because they can use the information that they took and they received in the interpersonal task with where they interpreted their interlocutor, if I may. And then also responded to their partners as well and shared information. And they can share that here. And then we as teachers can listen to that in our grade book once they have submitted it. So that's number one. Number two, interpersonal follow-up number two, simple, except in this case, it's using and, and written response. Jeannie says, would you assign this as homework? I have shy students who don't want to record in class. Yeah, I had plenty of students come to me and they was, oh, Mr. Castor, I really don't like responding to other people. And I would say, okay, fine, just do it at home. It wasn't my favorite thing when they said that, but I never wanted to force them to speak in class or be uncomfortable. So I said, all right, as long as you do it at home, and then they could, especially with the time prompt, because they can't see them beforehand. Yeah, so you you definitely could assign this as homework, Jeannie, at least for a formative assessment. If it was summative, I might have them step out in the hall or go to a place where they're comfortable recording. For number two, you could just sort of flip the script and just give them a written response. Right? Again, this text would be in your in the target language. You got a message from Sophie about the cookout, respond appropriate in the target language. It requires interpreting of the message and it requires giving an appropriate response both in register and the content and completing the task of, can you answer these questions and provide them in a simple message? You could do that. And of course you could add timers here as well. Yeah, Mirna, that's that's the whole point. Extemporary has accents. So I'll make a response to Mirna. So Mirna, Mirna asked, uh, she says, small tasks are connected to the formative assessment. The whole point is to go back and add them to, and excuse me, and connect it to what you're doing. You're constantly reinforcing vocabulary. You're constantly, you know, a lot of repetition with the target language, and that's what's help. That's going to that's what's going to help uh, build the the knowledge and help students, uh, you know, just acquire the, the language that we're looking for, so that they can complete a target task. It might seem repetitive, but language requires that. Thank you, Kelly. Learning a language requires a lot, a lot, a lot of repetition. So this is number two. I'll be honest with you. I think one and two could definitely be enough for an interpersonal assessment to follow a lesson. But if you're so inclined, you could definitely add one more. And that's what I did. You have an actual interpersonal to the interpersonal, a follow-up to the follow-up, where you have the cookout plan. I do my survey with my class. I get information. I know who likes to play baseball. I know who likes to play soccer. I know who doesn't like archery. And now I can determine what I wanna do at the cookout, except I have to take into account somebody else's plans. So I go to Joy and I talk to Joy and I say, hey, Joy, I just learned all of these things about my classmates. Then decide together what should be the final determined activities. Right? So I have information from the survey during class. Joy has information from the survey during class. We talk together in a little extemporary room for however long we need to. And then we can come up with a decision together. Again, I wouldn't necessarily add this, but if you're so inclined and you really want to keep it going, you can definitely add the little sync room and have your students talk together about what they learned from one another and come up with a plan for this really, really exciting cookout. A quick recap, and then I'll be happy to answer some questions. This, uh, for the sync rooms, these record for a minimum of five minutes. Of course, students can submit and then be done with it whenever they're done. So that would take maximum five minutes. Number two, I don't know, what do we think? I think maybe if I'm being generous, four or five, six minutes maybe for a response because students have to 
a lot of interpreting here and then coming up with a response and typing and deleting and fixing errors, maybe four or five minutes here. And then for this one, again, a maximum of two minutes. Jeannie, yeah, figuring out the logistics around the rooms isn't actually as hard as you think. Callie can attest about our headphones, which you can use as well, which are really helpful. So two minutes, four or five minutes, five minutes, absolute maximum. That puts us at 10, 12 minutes right at the end of class to, um, to finish up with an assessment. Any questions? No worries, you No worries, you may, may, this would be for maybe novice high students, I think. I did this with my level twos. Any questions? Then we'll move to presentational. Okay. We've recapped. We've talked about interpretive assessment, We've talked about interpersonal assessments. Let's look at the last one. So for a class with a presentational focus, what might we add in? So for a warm up, I always let look. If you if you think I love the word follow up, it's because I do. We would follow up on the interpersonal, right? We would have something from what they did the day before. We would look at their extemporary responses and then we would respond to them, right? Do you agree with so-and-so's plans for the cookout this weekend? How could they improve their plans? You know, interpret them, right? Because our students are speaking in the target language. All we have to do, ask your students, is it okay if I put your video in front of the class? Interpret what they said and write a few things in English about what they said. Easy interpretive assignment to reinforce vocabulary. That's what we want to do, reinforce vocabulary. You do it on Padlet, you do it on Extemporary, you can do it on a host of different platforms. Any way to follow up on the interpersonal uh, is great. Then what I might do in order to prepare for, for a presentational type of assignment is provide sentence starters and level up phrases. You might watch a video with certain examples, and then after they see those examples, students could go back and make their own. Here are some examples. In my opinion, Right. Learning how to say that expression in your target language. Word on the street is one of my favorite English expressions. I've heard that. I mean, these are all expressions that we could use. You just tack on a sentence afterwards. That's a great way for students to level up their vocabulary and just add a bit more of you know spice and flavor to what they're saying um, regarding this cookout task. Once you do that and you show them a video and they practice doing these, go back to Padlet. Go back to whatever site you were on where you had the interpersonal follow-up and have them add these in, right? Again, see them over and over and over. Even if they only pick up one of these, well, that's one more than, than they had before, right? Constantly using them, constantly repeating these phrases. And finally, you might wrap up that day with a special person interview or my favorite one minute news. We have a presenter at the front of the class and they're presenting on something. It's followed by interpersonal questions. Again, you can use Padlet or Poll everywhere for those. And it's all, it's a consistent question and answer, a really good inter, interpersonal task for students to do. You have someone presenting and then a bunch of questions and then scaffolded questions as well. And when you use something like Poll Everywhere or say, um, what's it called? Oh my gosh, Mem, Menti, Mentimeter, right? You can have students post their questions onto the screen and they can use, tell them, use these sentence starters in your questions, right? In my opinion, you know, I don't think the afternoon would be a best time for a cookout instead of, because it's really hot. What do you think about doing it in the evening? And then the student, the speaker could respond to that. If you could start with a warm up, give them some sentence starters to reinforce their language and then have a special person interview. I know I have my times here, but my Zoom is covering. Yeah, 10 to 12 minutes for the beginning, 10 to 15 minutes, and then again, maybe 10 to 12 minutes. Adds up right to around 30 or 40 minutes. And then we can finish with an assessment on extemporary. Presentational focused, speaking. Hey, that guy looks familiar. So we have a question. Check out the question. Student would go to extemporary and this is what they would say. For this question on extemporary, the task goes back to what we've been talking about, the cookout. The cookout is on and you are one with all the key details. Now all that remains is get the word out. So we wanna spread the word. Record a short video on TalkTech for all in your community so they can learn about the event. Consider using the sentence starters. I put on the right side for the, for, if, you, if this was a formative assessment, you wanna see where your students are. Maybe you add those sentence starters. If it's summative assessment, maybe you wanna remove those. That's entirely up to you and how you wanna do this. You also see that I added a little um, timer here where the student has to speak for at least 10 seconds and they can record for a maximum of a minute and 30 seconds here. Very simple, efficient presentational task for your students to do. And there's a lot that we can learn. Again, we're looking for evidence. 
we want to see where our students are with the language, there's a ton that we can learn from a simple video like this, where they're producing a target language and making a video um, about the upcoming cookout. Likewise, the reverse would be the written one. They recorded their video, and when we see social posts, oftentimes Instagram, Facebook, what have you, you have your video, you have your text. Have them make text for it. Right? Now that you've recorded your video, compose a short post outlining all the details, um, including when, where, and what the main events will be. Those are those hobbies, activities we talked about earlier. This is very helpful. I think this is where students will relate. For people who, unfortunately, are too lazy to watch your video or just don't have the time. So we want to read it, but I might not have 90 seconds to watch the video, so I'll read the, I'll read the post instead. Again, if it's a formative assessment, you can keep the starters, maybe remove the timers. If it's summative, up to you, right? You can remove the starters. I always think they're really hand, uh, handy and giving students a little bit of a boost in what they want to say. But that's for a presentational assessment. You have your video. You have your written response. We're looking for evidence. Can they complete this task? Their response will give us a lot of evidence that can answer that question. Pause. Let's recap. You'll see here I have a timer for this question. Maybe it takes them, I don't know, a minute to read the directions. As soon as they start recording, they have a minute and a half. That's two and a half minutes, but a lot that we can get out of their response and we can know their levels. Number two, three minutes max to respond. I think I gave them one minute to read the directions here. So that's four and a half minutes, three minutes, three, three plus one is four. Four minutes total to <laughs> respond to this question. Four minutes here maybe three and a half minutes there, seven, eight minute assessment. But the amount of information we're getting from our students about their language levels via a response to this question and a written response to this level, to this question, is a lot. We're learning how well they can present. Can they complete the task of describing an event? Can they complete the task of giving a social post about this event? Jeannie says, I like to give my speaking portion first. It's very similar. To that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's the whole idea here, right? They're, they're speaking and then sort of there's a little bit less pressure of the written response. We recap, this would be a fairly short assessment, and that's really it. So let's look at some final tips on creating some efficient assessments on Extempore for you all. Tasks and community of language. If you couldn't tell, we were really focused on that today. When you're giving interpretive-based assessments, ask yourself, what are they interpreting and why are they interpreting it? How can I make them interpret as much as possible in just one question or in as few questions as possible, right? Asking those questions within the question, I know it's getting pretty meta, but again, you know, high quality multiple choice questions, really pushing your students to interpret as much as possible. Um, and, I, and I mentioned earlier, you know, students can always get lucky with multiple choice, but we use multiple choice to save ourselves times. How can I limit that? How can you limit your students from getting lucky on multiple choice and thinking about making them interpret as much as possible? To continue with interpersonaling, interpreting or presenting, what are they figuring out together, right? What's the purpose behind the interpersonal? And then how are they gonna use that information and then for presentational, what are students presenting, to whom are students presenting, and why are they presenting this? All based around the task. Going back to the question, what are we doing with the language and why are we doing that? We're trying to complete the task. That's, that is the question we always come back to. I mentioned that in my session on Monday. If you couldn't tell also, keep them short and sweet. That's what we like. We get the evidence when we need from the students, we learn from that evidence, and then we apply it to our next lessons and the next things that we do in class the next day. And then finally, like everything else in, in life, experiment, adapt, and give it time, right? Play with it. See what questions you like. See what questions you don't like. See how student responds. See how students respond to different type of questions. See how they, you know, how they, how they perform, right? The presentational, see how they respond to the timers. The timers always take a little bit of getting used to with students. They always say, oh, Mr. Castor, I feel so much pressure when there's timers. Six months later, they've done enough of them that they feel like, okay, this is a time assessment. This is just gonna, this is just how it's gonna be, right? They get used to it. Students will adjust, we can adjust too. Tasks, keep it connected to the community of language, keep them short and sweet. Students don't need to feel enough pressure as it is, right? And then experiment, adapt, and give it time. Those would be my main, main tips for putting these together. That is really it. Thank you. If you have any questions, comments, or please, I love them, hot takes, please feel free to share. We have plenty of resources on our YouTube, Facebook, and uh, that app channels at Extempore app. That's us. Ex join our Facebook group, if you don't mind, run by the lovely Extempore ambassador, Kelly Rump. Uh, a lot of cool stuff in there. And then check out some testimonials that we have. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about what you saw today. 
um, talking about efficient assessments, and hopefully you found this useful. Thank you so much. Can I ask you a question? Please. Oh. Hey. I mean, when are you gonna put uh, Su King? I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. On on extempore. What do you, what do you the, mean, Johanna? The the one that the twelve thirty presentation. Oh, it'll which be was the super good. The recording. It's still, not, it's still not there. Yeah. I've been scrambling. It will be there very soon. I, pro I promise. Because I already I already have I already told some people that were not in the 1230 how good it was that they need to watch it i promise so, and, then, you, and then it was me, not there if you give me 20 minutes i promise the recording will be up later this evening the slides i will put up as soon as i close this okay okay thank you thank you for your patience i appreciate it grant what does the teacher side look like yeah that's a great question that is a wonderful question let me show you real quick i was thinking i was thinking i'm like do i have time to show the teacher side uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to show you what that looks like here. Oh my gosh. Zoom, stop. Oh, okay. I'm pulling it up right now. Is Extempore an app that the kids use on their phone yep. or do they have to go to, so it's yep. an app? So, so, so it's both. They can do it on Chrome, desktop, way. whatever you want. They can also download the mobile apps. My students would always do it on their phones. And again, like any other platform that you introduce to your students, it takes time, right? But with enough practice, with enough repetition, your students will adapt and get, and, and, and get used to it. So let me show you here. Okay, this works. So one second, let me resume. Okay, you should be able to see my screen, correct? Okay, so this is what it looks like. Once those responses have been submitted, I did all of those from like a sort of demo account so they don't go in, but they pop up here in the grade book. So community manager, that's me, Joy, that's Haley, my colleague. We did this little video together. So when you go in, you can then see, okay, here's the question. This is when it was submitted, here's who participated. And then we can see that, you know, me and Haley and I were in this room together and you can listen to that and give feedback for their response. Does that help, Aaron? Yeah, <laughs> is there, can you also like put rubrics? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. So I, I, didn't, I didn't get to the rubrics today. Our, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say this, our rubrics have been totally revamped and they're being released literally like this week, like as we, like next week, like as we speak, um, we will have a ton of new information about our new rubrics. They're really, really, really cool. Um, you can share them, you can modify them. They're, it's big. I don't, ex I do not mean to be hyperbolic, but it's really, really significant update for our platform. <laughs> Yeah, and when and when and so when you add Aaron, when you add the rubric in here, then you can you can score it based on the rubric, and then give them points and all and all sorts of stuff like that. So yeah, yes, Kimiko, plenty and plenty of tutorials. I promise, plenty, and you know who's going to be making them. Your boy, right, right here. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Thank you, Jeannie. I really appreciate it. May we have a we have a free version and a sort of freemium paid version as well. So you can learn more on our site. I intentionally copied these links beforehand so that I wouldn't have to go fishing for them. My slides are here as well. Please complete the feedback as always. I'll stop recording and we can chat more.